Well, good afternoon everybody. It's a rather crappy Sunday afternoon here in sunny, not so sunny, southwest Scotland. But anyway, I thought I'd give you my latest uh, um, witness to the witnesses, uh, which occurred last week, sorry, it was, uh, the week just gone. On Monday I went to my uncle's funeral and my uncle um, was from Ellesmere Port. Um, he was a witness before my family were witnesses. In fact, uh, they tried to witness to our family and my mum wasn't having any of it. And, and eventually, actually, um, the person who chapped his door eventually chapped our, my mum's door. And uh, so we can blame her, not him. So uh, anyway, um, he was a witness and his whole family were witnesses. And then he stopped going uh, for many years and his marriage broke up. Um, and he moved to a place called Prestatin, whereupon he, he became an elder. Uh, he had a, an aneurysm which um, did one side of him in, but he fought back so he was still able to walk with a walking stick and still drive. But unfortunately, um, he got diagnosed with um, cancer earlier this year, and um, well, it, it just it, it just killed him in the end. So it was quite sad to see pictures of him. Um, the way he was shortly before his death, it, it was really awful. It reminded me of my stepfather, uh, and it's uh, it's not it's not a nice thing to see, um, especially as he was quite a big bloke. He was a, a former shipyard worker, and um, from the the place where I'm coming from, Ellesmere Port, anybody who works down at the uh, shipyard are called dockers. I don't think they have many dockers these days because not many ships about, but they, he was a docker. And the expression was the dockers always had, we believe, a ferocious appetite. And so that if you had anything that was rather big, it was called a docker sandwich. You know, if you had like three levels of bread, it was called a docker sandwich. Anything to it to anything to explain anything that was rather big was you you, you said it was docker. Anyway, that's <laughs> you don't use that any day these days anyway. So anyway, I um because he was a, a witness, he had a, a witness funeral, which I wasn't looking forward to at all, which was held at, uh, in the Chester Crematorium. And his daughter, uh, his, his, his son sadly, uh, or Carl sadly died several years ago. Um, but his daughter uh, allowed for his father's wishes for him to have a service done by the witnesses. And I met my uh, cousins before, my cousin and his wife before, uh, the ceremony and I said this is a, a witness funeral it says it might be a bit impersonal however I was very very wrong it was very personal I mean and I learned things about uh, my uncle Mike I never knew before and it was really nice that they, they did at the end obviously refer to uncle Mike's hope for the future which obviously they always do and uh, a lot of people started uh, looking up the scriptures because as those you know, the press that and congregation were there uh, and afterwards my cousin said to me, he says, what was going on there? He says, the guy was telling them to, to, to it was reading something and everybody had the phones out. And I says, oh, that's because these days <laughs> with technology, nobody uses a thing called the Bible as in a book with a lot of pages in it. Nowadays, it's all boom, 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 boom. Then it is on your phone or on your tablet. So he thought they were just, you know, he thought all of a sudden there was this mass breakout of people you know, checking themselves in at the crematorium on Facebook, you know, just see what the football results was. You know, he had no uh, clue what was going on. I explained it to him afterwards, even though I'd never seen it personally. And I actually missed everybody doing that because they were the other side of the um, place where we were having the funeral. The, the witnesses were on the left and a bit of the family and, and the, all the friends and family on the right. So I actually never miss it. And while they were asking to read scriptures, I was actually staring out the window. Um, we got to sing a, a witnessy song, uh, which I refused to sing and stared out the window. Um, when it came to doing a prayer, I refused to close my eyes and again stared out the window. So most of the service I was staring out the win window, apart from when he was talking about my uncle Mike, whereupon I was actually spe uh, watching the, the elder give his uh, talk. So we all went to a social club. It used to be the Shell Social Club in Ellesmere Port. It's now called the Whitby Social Club. And the last time I was there, bizarrely, I, it was either for my uh, my cousin's funeral, where my uncle Mike was alive, and that was the um, last time I saw him. 
uh, alive. And we we went there, had a couple of drinks, and then the whole all the el all the um, elder and the current most of the congregation came in. So I just thought, should I, should I go up and speak to them? <laughs> should I maybe just hold? And I for, for quite a long time I just thought, no, I'm I'm going to not speak to the witnesses, which isn't something I, I usually refrain from. And I just thought, you know, it's time to go. And I just thought, I'll just go up and, and thank him for um, his talk. And I went up and he was th he was here. Uh, there's a woman here. No, there's a woman here. There's a woman here, a girl here and a boy there. So I sat on the edge and I spoke to him. I said, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you for your talk. It was, uh, it was, it was really nice. You talked about, uh, about the man instead of his belief. And I said, I've been to a lot of witness um funerals where they talk more about the guy's beliefs than actual the person themselves very impersonal and he said no he says i tend to, i tend make to make my um talks at funerals uh not a sermon i said oh, i really enjoyed it i says because i've gone to a lot of witness um things and it, and he said to me well how, how are you related to mike i says well michael mike was my uncle and we were in the same congregation for many years and I was in Newport and I moved to Scotland and I said well I'm no longer a witness so of course that intrigued him and he said well why don't you go anymore and I said oh well I said I don't go because of um, what started the, the road to me leaving was the, um, the change in the view of the uh, creative days no longer being 7,000 years old upon which he turned around to me and this guy must be I can't tell his age he may be about my age or a little bit older or a little bit younger it's, it's sometimes hard to tell depending on <laughs> what life they've had or how how, how bald they are or how grey they are or how long they've been in the sun uh, or what sort of job they've got and he said to me um, it is still 7,000 years and I said no it's not I said it said 7,000 years in the eight understanding book but when the a -bot got replaced by those two volumes, the thought changed. Instead of saying 7,000 years, they changed it to thousands of years. And he says, no, it still is 7,000 years. And I said, it isn't. I says, I actually wrote to the society and asked them that very question. Because Adam was supposed to be the last creation. That's why 75 was a marked date. That would be end of the next day, the 6,000 years. And that would leave 1,000 years for Jesus' reign to to end <laughs> the whole week, as it were. And uh, then all of a sudden, of course, Armageddon didn't come in 75. And then the witnesses realised, well, actually, Adam's not the last creation. It was Eve. So that's why we believe that we were living in the time that it took Adam to name all the animals in the world. And there's loads and loads of animals. So I wrote to the society. And the society, I said, are we still to say that we're living in the time that it took Adam to name all the animals in the world? And do we still believe that the creative days are 7,000 years long? And the letter I got back from them, they just bluffed it. They, they, they would not be committed to saying, yes, it is 7,000 years long. And I said, so, so they totally, you know, avoided the issue. And he says, no, it still is 7,000 years long. I'm thinking, no, it's not. And then I, I said, then what happened was, I says the change in the generation. I says millions, you know. Says I went out on on the promise, but the that the generation that saw nineteen forty would by no means pass away. Not the, um, the not the overlapping generation, the generation. And he says that generation is still with us. I says no, it's not. I says millions now uh, now living may never die. I says they're all dead. I says that Watchtower nineteen forty and all the old people at the fronts, they're all dead. I said, that generation's passed away. I, I don't know why you used to think this generation's still with us. I said, and then because they kept on changing the thoughts, I had no confidence anymore. And when I answered at the group, which was being held in my house to encourage me because I was doubting, and then I used to have to put up my hand and say, you know, the society now believe, or the society now is saying, when potentially that view could change in five years or ten years or whenever, you know? And... Um, you know, I just couldn't understand why, why he was still believing in the old truths. I said, so therefore, I said to him, I had no confidence when I went out preaching that I was still speaking the truth to people. And therefore, I lost my faith and found myself in a really, really dark and horrible place when I left the witnesses. Because everything I believed in my social structure, all my friends, they were gone. I said, but I had to be true to myself and I could no longer go. And then I turned to... Um, I said to him, I says, for instance, I says, the religion that I, I says, the religion that is now, I says, it is unrecognisable to the, the religion I was brought in up with. 
and left over 20 years ago. I said, for instance, what, what's massively changed is the, um, is the memorial partakers. I says, when I was there, I says, my governing body were all older people, you know, and I named a few names, Schroeder and, you know, Franz and Barr and, you know, and guys like this. I said, they're all dead. They're all gone. I said, they expected Armageddon to come in their lifetime. I says, they're, they're gone now. And the memorial partakers have gone from um, 8,600 20 years ago to now 21,000. I says, what explains that? So his wife, who was just over here, piped in and says, well, it's, 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 it's the intake <laughs> from Africa. And I'm going, what do you mean? She says, well, a lot of the brothers who've come in from, uh, from Africa um, formerly were Catholics, had a Catholic belief, and they believed in, in the heavy belief, and they've, they've, they've kept those beliefs with them. So these ones have, have partaken of the, the emblems, and, and their participation has to be <laughs> counted. And I thought to myself, that's a bit odd, because everybody who came from Europe, or the Western world, not the African continent, prior to becoming Jehovah's Witnesses, we were probably Anglican, or Baptists, or, or Protestants, or Catholics, and every one of them believed in the heavenly hope. And they had to change that thinking completely to then thinking, actually, I've now got an earthly hope. But the one thing that stands Jehovah's Witnesses different to every other religion is this earthly hope so I couldn't quite get around my head that you have baptized African intakers who then become partakers <laughs> because they're still holding to this heavenly hope when clearly when you come with Jehovah's Witness you're told no heavenly hope's not for you it's you know it's stroking badges wearing you know smart casuals and living in front of a lot of wooden lodge and eating vegetables is a life for you. So I never accepted that. And I said to myself, well, what explains the fact that when I was younger, in the 80s and 90s, if anybody younger than us in the Western world would have came out and says, I'm a mo uh, I've been anointed by God's Holy Spirit, you would have laughed in their face. Because everyone at that time that we knew who had partaken of the emblems were in their 70s. I says, how is it? That there's a governing body member, therefore, who's not only became a, a memorial partaker, is now in the governing body. And he went to me, um, oh, you mean, I think his name's Mark Sanders, or Mark Sanders, and he says, and I says, yes. I says, he's younger than me. I says, how is that even possible? Do you know, there was, there was no response to that one, no response. And I said to him about um, Stephen Lett, I refer to that Stephen Lett, uh, talk prior to the last memorial which I, I did mention on a previous video whereupon he says that Jehovah God is a great communicator that uh, the Holy Spirit is the most powerful act to force in the universe and if anybody's thinking this time partaking of the emblems and you only think you're 70 or 80 percent sure then you haven't been chosen because Jehovah God would make sure that you are a hundred percent sure that you've been been chosen by him I says how is it therefore that when these brothers who are spirit anointed try to then look at, at the Bible, at the words of writ or written by men who were not spirit anointed, that when they get together, they're continually having to change their understanding of application of scripture. I says, what happened to the great communicator? What happened to this most powerful force in the universe? I says, why are they constantly having to change the teachings and then pushing it out as new light? I says, this doesn't make any sense at all. Because I mentioned Stephen Lett's video, um, his wife then said to me, well, um, you know, you, you've been away for 20 years. Why, why are you still interested in what the witnesses teach? And I said to her, quite frankly, I said, well, my mum's still a Jehovah's Witness. I never mentioned that what's happened in the past. I said, my brother is. And uh, I said, I can't get away from the fact I belong to this organisation for 28 years. And I gave up, um, you know, potentially a, a promising career in the music world. <laughs> But further education, I says, I sacrificed all those so I could go pioneer and clean windows. I says, so, you know, it still haunts me to this day what I gave up and what I went through as a witness. I says, so I'm obviously still interested in, in, in the way this organisation is going, especially when, you know, we believe that Armageddon was imminent. And I said to her, I says, for instance, says every Jehovah's Witness that I, I've known and has died, 
all believed, all believed that Armageddon was going to come in their lifetime, that they'd be in a paradise. It says, you know, if Armageddon had come, this is my uncle Mike wouldn't have had to suffer the way he did. But he did, because Armageddon um, never appeared when it was supposed to appear very time soon, a long, long time ago. So um, I, I referred to that, and then I referred to the, the fact that I can't get away from what the witnesses believe is because it, I says two weeks ago it was all over the news in the in the British news it was all over about um, Jehovah's Witnesses um, and the, the 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 child abuse scandal and he then said to me well unfortunately the organisations are set up so that people when they come to, into organisation can take advantage of our trusting nature and uh, therefore that they that's that's what they're able to do he says and the society have admitted mistakes i says okay I says, but what gets around the fact that the, some of these abusers are elders who've been appointed by holy spirit and his his retort to that was which i find unbelievable unbelievably uh, very sad for him to come out this and says well didn't jesus christ appoint Judas to be one of his disciples. Oh, so that makes it okay then. That explains away that one completely. Bizarre. So then I, I, I then said to him, just referring to how the organisation changed, he says, what, what about the Carters? I says, what about the Carters? I said, I says, you don't even speak to people on the streets anymore. I says, I've gone spoke, spoken to people on the street and they let people walk past all the time. They don't go and approach them. I says, it must be so easy. I says, I'd love to do that. As, as a pioneer, just stand there, do nothing, just, you know, I says, I says, that's not preaching. I says, Jesus Christ would not stand there and and and, and stay silent. And his wife turned around and says, oh, we, we can't approach people in the doors anymore, uh, in the street anymore. I says, why is that? She says, uh, because of the European law. And I looked at her and said, European law? And then her husband responded back and says, yes, oh, European law. I says, well, what is European law? I've never heard of this in my life ever. And I've spoken to a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, Carting, and they've never ever said, or oh, the reason why we don't approach any pe uh, people anymore, because European law. Well, we, we're in Brexit now, so we're out of Europe. So even if this European law exists, does it still apply? And I said to them, says, that doesn't make any sense, because I've been in New Zealand and observed the Carters doing the same thing as every Carter I've ever seen. Uh, observed in Europe, whereupon they won't go up and speak to people, they'll wait for people to speak to them. I don't understand this because, you know, obviously they're trying to uh, give out propaganda and talk to people about God's heavenly government, and I've been involved with giving out propaganda relating to trying to get people's attention to through the correct way for them to vote in the Scottish government. And I've approached people on the streets and nobody said to me, oh, you can't be doing that because that's against law to approach somebody, a complete stranger on the street and, get, and engage in conversation or give them a tractable leaflet. I said to them, I says, well, how come you can still go to the doors then? How come if you, you can't approach people on the street, how come you can go to people on the doors? He says, well, if there's a door, it means that's an invitation for us to knock it. I think, sorry, the reason why we have doors in houses is, is so we can get into the house. That's why there's a door. There's a letterbox so the postman could, can post things in. And there's a door knocker so that it's, if there's somebody like a friend or, or a neighbour wants to come and see us, we can say, hello, there you go. You know, or even the postman to sign anything. Because there's a door and a door knocker and a bell, that's not an invitation for somebody to come to our door unannounced and try and persuade us that if we don't join Jehovah's Witnesses, we're going to die at Armageddon. A really odd thinking that was. So anyway... The, if anybody's a Jehovah's Witness out there, if anybody's just left, has anybody still got any witnesses or still in the organisation who are, are chatty terms with them, please, please, please find out for me what this European law exists, where it is, where I can see it online, which means that Jehovah's Witnesses cannot approach people on the street. I think they're talking nonsense personally, but I'd love to know what it is. Because I need to be ready for the next time I speak to the Carters and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to this European law if it, if it does exist. If it doesn't exist, it means these are, you know, the, the Prestatin congregation of, you know, believe all beliefs and have maybe gone a bit rogue. I don't really know. But anyway, at the end of the conversation, the guy turns around to me and says, do you believe Armageddon's going to come? I says, no, I don't. 
He says, you sound a bit cynical to me. I says, well, to be honest with you, he says, when you spent 28 years of your life cynically looking at what the world had to offer, politics, religion, uh, advancement, uh, education, uh, dreams, hopes, desires, and you were told, no, they're in the hands of Satan, the devil, so you cynically looked at everything that was on offer, and then you only had your religion, Jehovah's Witnesses, and when you all of a sudden find out that the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, that there were really big problems, and there were no better in a lot of cases than what other religious uh, groups were like in the world, I says, no wonder I am cynical. So that's the way the conversation ended. I thanked him again for his time, and we parted on God good terms. Unfortunately, next to the mum and dad were the next generation of pioneers, the young daughter, about 16, the son, 17, uh, you know, 16, 17, I thought that's going to be the next generation of the golden elder children. We don't know how long they're going to last being pioneers, but that's another couple who potentially could have achieved something in this world. Maybe they have hopes and dreams and desires. They've been told just to wait to, uh, to the paradise. Maybe they're good at playing the piano or the guitar or painting or whatever it is, or running or whatever it is. But uh, needless to say, the, the, that's been quashed so they can go out and have a, a shitty part-time job and not speak to people on the streets because of this European law. So that's my latest encounter with Jehovah's Witnesses. If uh, Again, please, please, please leave a comment and then tell me what this European law is that stops Jehovah's Witnesses approaching people on the streets. I'm keen to know and look it up myself. Anyway, I'm off. Bye bye. Have a, have a good time.